You're invited to imagine what's next. What the next view you wake up to will be. Where your next adventures will start from. Your perfect space to entertain. And your sanctuary to unwind in. As you begin to imagine your new place, we'll be here to help you find it. Because nothing compares to what's next. Sotheby'sRealty.com COP28, the world's only multilateral decision-making forum on climate change, has begun in Dubai. Now, simply explained, COP is where the world comes together to agree on ways to address the climate crisis and limit the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. On the urban agenda, we ask what should India's contribution to COP28 be, especially when it comes to urbanization and climate change. After all, cities are where more than half of humanity lives. Globally, cities account for 70% of carbon or CO2 emissions. Buildings and transportation are the two largest energy guzzlers uh, and biggest contributors of these emissions. A rapidly urbanizing India is following closely in global footsteps. By 2030, almost 70% of the national GDP will come from our cities. And by 2050, more than half or 850 plus million Indians are expected to be living in cities. Well, in the last nine years, India has not only embarked on the world's largest planned urbanization program, as said by the Minister of uh, Housing and Urban Affairs. Uh, the ministry also says that there's been a tenfold increase in urban development investment since 2014. Well, the country has also concluded the Urban 20 or U20 City Diplomacy Initiative. Uh, what we are asking today is what should we as a country be pushing for to ensure more climate resilient cities. My expert panel today, Hitesh Vedya, former director, National Institute of Urban Affairs. Also, Devashish Dhar, author, India's Blind Sport, which is quite an extensive and interesting read on India's urban challenges. Mr. Vedya, you are heading to COP28 um, as a delegate with a specialization in, you know, climate resilient cities. You're also taking along the U20 vision for sustainable cities. Tell us, how will this add uh, value to COP28 negotiations on reducing carbon footprint specifically across cities of the world and in India? The seven things which came up very clearly, and I think those should be the key points while India is going to talk about uh, COP28. And these seven things which were coming up, uh, which came out was, let's first localize climate agendas. We have Paris Agreement, we have Sendai Framework, we have Urban Engagement. All of them are good, but how do you localize it? So it mainly came up with the action on the ground is the one of the key uh, takeaway uh, from the COP. Like while we talk about it, uh, how do you uh, uh, convert the dharma to the karma? I think that's the where we need to work out. Uh, second is sustainable urban planning came out across the thing that while we are talking about climate action, unless we build in the legal instrument, which is our master plans, which is our, uh, 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 you know, bylaws, unless you build climate action in your master plans and planning instrument, nothing will work out. So action remains and how do you improve your planning instruments? Third thing came out because this is not a, a new thing. We are going to, we have spoiled the world and now we are retrofitting it. You know, so retrofitting is much more challenging than actually uh, building a new green uh, build. Uh, fourth thing came up, which I think yesterday also while we were talking separately was finance. Where is the money coming from? How do you generate those money? Our cities do not have that much of uh, uh, funding. So how do you bring uh, cities become themselves sufficient? We, we call it Atam Nirbhar, but Atam Nirbhar at a city level, how do you really work out on that? Se second is, how do you really use the USP of city, the culture of city, uh, to make it economic development? I think that's uh, another area where we have neglected so far, uh, uh, and we need to really work on it. And lastly, I think the data and technologies which are going to be our LA. Uh, Mr. Vedya, you've summed it up so nicely that I'm wondering now, what do I take up with uh, Devashish as the big talking point? But you know, I think I'm going to stick to karma to dharma, right? Because that's exactly what everyone is speaking at a global level also, that you know, you have 80,000 delegates, you have 200 countries participating in COP28. When are those intentions going to turn into actionable items? And that's pretty much our cities in India. You know, you may have 
spent tenfold since 2014. There is a national uh, focus on cities. However, is it really translating to resilient cities on the ground? I think that's the big question, Devashish. You tell us, you worked at the Niti Aayog, you've written this uh, ex excellent book. Where do you think are the gaps? I mean, what can COP28 do to marry what India's ambitions are on its urbanization goals? I do want to sort of uh, take forward this conversation from the point that I think there's also the um, issue of the narrative where we still sort of focus on industrialization, economic activity and sort of rural political economy when it comes to climate change. But there's a whole bunch of activities that go on in the urban areas and particularly climate change is at the nexus of land uh, mobility, buildings, and energy, right? And that's where you can do a whole lot of interventions there on that part. First is that. The second part that I would add to the seven elements that uh, Professor Vadya said is about the whole issue of urban governance because when you have to sort of localize it and rather hyper-localize your interventions on climate change, it is very important that our cities are able to take that decision. So while it is one thing to say to the world that we need to sort of localize it, but I think our states need to sort of undertake this action on actually localizing it to devolution of power and perhaps think about something like having interventions on climate change within the 12th schedule. But we have such an unfulfilled promise that it is uh, too big to ask for. In terms of financing, I think India has made some really good progress on the municipal bonds. And I think if we continue to move on that path, I think we are looking to sort of unlocking a huge capital market instrument that will impose that market discipline on Indian cities and Indian state governments that will help in sort of climate change interventions, which will be very, very, very effective. And the third is, I want to say is that, you know, every country comes with its own model of urbanization. China did, Europe did, America did, you know, and, and, and many other civilizations before that. I think India is coming with its own form of urbanization, which is highly, highly resource efficient. But we need to sort of keep building on this model of resource efficiency. And I can sort of go on and on about government schemes, which has helped achieve that. So I think, but that was largely a national level intervention, but that, that needs to sort of percolate to the state level and the municipal level action. And uh, lastly, I want to say is that we need to sort of expand that dialogue to include much more of the migrant population, urban mm. poor, and, and women and children. So you know, make the dialogue much more holistic. Okay, you know, we basically summed it up, but I think, let me just delve into one area and one aspect of how do you build infrastructure which is resilient? How do you have enough money as a developing country? And uh, Dr. Vedya, financing is very, very critical. Now, we know that there is a big gap between India's thoughts and the developed world. The carbon footprint and the big hole that we see in the environment is caused by the developed world. But when it comes to really that climate finance, which was agreed upon during Pla Paris Agreement, you know, the interpretation of it has left much wanting. The monies are not flowing into India. And cities specifically, I know we've done something positive with municipal bonds, but we have a long, long way to go. First thing which we need to do is cities need to understand where they are in the journey of climate. Are they prepared for the climate uh, action? And that is what I think more than the money is, is the data uh, which is uh, going to be the new oil, uh, is important if we want to really um, uh, um, unlock these pots of money. And, and, and that is the biggest challenge in the cities right now, rather than the funding of the uh, uh, projects. You know, one of the uh, area where the ministry has done, and I think that was a great idea to work on it, was uh, look at cities, are they prepared for climate issues? And we looked at it again. We did not look at a climate is a big world. You know, you can talk anything under the sky and it becomes a climate. What are the five or six areas where cities are really day to day struggling with the day to day issues? And these were urban planning and green cover. These were green building, as Devashish talked about. This uh, was about uh, energy efficiency. These were about mobility and air quality. These were about water and man uh, management and waste management. These are five or six areas where cities are struggling day-to-day -day function. And they understand that language. If you tell them that, you know, you are coming with the climate issue and climate finance, they don't understand. Mm -hmm. So make them prepare uh, for their roadmap. And, you know, I think that is where we have. We have a, nat a national action climate plan. We have a state action climate plan. Why not we have a city action climate plan? So there has to be a grid. Then you know where your journey is, how you are trying to really uh, 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 move forward. Unless you have a roadmap, where I go from X to Y, 
uh, you know, having a pot of money will not make any difference. I think those are the areas where we need to really uh, start struggling. Municipal sure. bond is one of the things, but I think more issue is how do we unlock? Because unless you have a credit worthiness of a city, nobody will open the pots for you. Absolutely. And, and you know, we may be able to negotiate anything at COP28, but finally the money flowing into a city totally depends on what you rightly said, what data do they have? Based on that data, have they planned out, have they broken their requirements into different areas, which is water, waste, transportation, etc. So then we come back to something which is very basic, Devashish, and we have discussed this before, it's been written time and again, that you know most of the cities in India do not even have a master plan. Forget master plan, they don't even have the data. Like for example, we don't know where the drainage systems are. I, I don't think many of the cities, like you write in your book, even have a clear idea of the city's drainage system and you know flood floods are going to become more and more frequent heavy rainfall is going to become more and more frequent so tell me i mean how do we everyone now is because of the attention on urbanization i think the gaps have been spoken about and talked about a lot uh, uh, nuia has worked uh, under dr vedya fairly closely with mawa as well to bring focus on onto it what is your recipe to translate it at local level you know, or do we need commissioners who are extremely committed because we don't have a mayoral system? I don't really feel that that's clearly necessary. What what do we do to translate it to the last mile, to the city level? You know, how cities operate, there is, you know, as as you say, right, that, you know, there's, there's a certain ingredient to be happy, but, you know, you're unhappy in different sort of ways. And that's why you have to find the lowest common denominator how to make cities function. And so when I say that, of course, there has to be a master plan and there are other things, right? But let me sort of go through the what I think is a bit of a checklist that can sort of help you achieve that. First, it's the whole issue on urban governance. I think unless you have mayors, because our cities are actually bigger than a lot of other countries. In fact, the difference between the 2011 uh, definition of what was census towns and what was statutory towns, the difference between those two definitions alone was equal to 12 Singapore. So I think we have to address on the urban governance issue and we need to have an urban mayoral system uh, uh, for accountability and for executive power and so on and so forth. I mean, there's no way out of it. Uh, one is that because the commissioners are accountable to the state governments, they're looking for the next posting, they're looking, they're also under a lot of pressure because they're moving in one and a half, two years. So that's one part of the issue. The second is that there are certain kind of interventions uh, that sort of they invite the investment first and second, they sort of catalyze the public action towards climate change and sort of sustainable living. So one thing that we saw uh, with the whole Swajh Bharat mission was not only the waste disposal collection and transportation, but we also saw how to sort of reduce waste. So one was that part. The third is we recently launched the initiative on electric buses, right? And I think there is no better solution in terms of last mile connectivity, reducing, reducing energy consumption and having energy efficiency than focusing on uh, bus transport. And I think I think it is an incredible initiative. We should, although we should target much more, but I think we are on the right track there. So that is that part. The also, another thing that I want to say about uh, climate change that, you know, that an intervention that can be made at city level, which is very, very basic, is restoring urban water bodies. In fact, I go on to, the, to an extent in saying in my book that although I am against urban erega because urban erega basically means that you've admitted you're not able to provide jobs, which is the key uh, key role of, of a city, right? To provide jobs. So urban erega was be, would be an admission that I, we have not been able to provide jobs. But if you're creating urban water bodies, I think that alone has such strong externalities on climate change, biodiversity, urban heat island effect, and, and many other factors that it makes a compelling case for urban erega if you're just doing that alone, right? So there are similar activities okay. that you can focus along, you know, certain, you know, at, at city level that can sort of catalyze first private investment and second public action. And third, also the narrative largely around it because people will say, oh, these are the kind of interventions that you're making. But as Dr. Uh, Professor Vaidya talked about uh, the municipal finance thing, as, as I mentioned about urban governance, right. as you said about urban planning, I think these are three indicators. And I would add just one more on the municipal cadre. Unless you have these four ingredients, you cannot really make the pot boil so to speak when in terms of achieving the taste on, on, on climate change. Right? Well wow that's an exhaustive list but if I were to sum it up uh, all that I can say is that governance um, is key planning is another thing that we need to get right and of course translating national ambitions into local ambitions will happen if those two things uh, absolutely come not just on paper but in action. 
Professor Vedya, all the very best. I hope you come back with some good news for the country with some concrete, let's say, financing options <laughs> for developed nations such as India uh, to make all of this happen. Because even retrofitting of buildings, for example, we will need a lot more finance to flow in, right? So while we work from the bottom, I think from the top, from the developed nations, we need much more. And there's been a big criticism that there's not enough participation of youth at COP28. Having Devashish, we fixed that on the show. Thank you, gentlemen, <laughs> for joining me today. Well, let's hope we get something right on mitigating carbon footprint of our cities and making them more resilient uh, after COP28, come back with more actionable ideas. The world has also just seen its hottest ever year in 2023, and the clock is truly ticking. When we come back, we also look at another crisis, climate crisis, which is rising air pollution, and we bring you an inspiring story of a citizen-led initiative which is working tirelessly to create green lungs in the national capital region. Welcome to Jaipur Polo Ground.